What's going on, everybody? I'm Kevin from Cigar Prop. I'm Jesse from Cigar Prop. And today we're smoking the Perla Del Mar from J.C. Newman Cigars. Um, is this a new cigar? I feel like I've seen this before. Well, it's kind of a new cigar. Um, I wish there was someone that could tell us just a little bit more about this cigar. Hi, Kevin, Jesse, how are you? Oh my God, it's, it's Bobby Newman. What are you doing here? I work here. You work here? Wow. Well, you may have guessed it. We are here at the El Relo factory in historic Ybor City, Florida. And, and Bobby Newman, uh, you're going to tell us a little bit about this cigar because uh, mm -hmm. this cigar has changed up a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the new Perla Del Mar? Absolutely. The, the We are smoking the Perla Del Mar Maduro, which is a Connecticut broadleaf uh, wrapper. So uh, last year, 2020, we spent almost the entire year developing new graphics, new boxes, new cigar bands, new labels. And But the most important thing we did is that we, we, we went, we changed the press from a hard press to a soft press. We call this a, a Tampa press or Ybor City press. When uh, Eric and I, were, my brother and I were growing up, uh, all the fat, all the cigars in Tampa were, were pressed just like this. Mm. So years ago, was it 20, 30 years ago, when people started box pressing cigars, the the consumers were so excited about it. But we've been people in Tampa have been doing this since 18, 1886 when the industry came here from Key West. That's well, now, what is the difference between a um, uh, like a hard press and a, and a Tampa press? What 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 is the um, what is the difference in the? Great question. The 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 real hard press is which we had on the previous Polo de Mar. The, the very, very it was a very hard press. The edges were it was a very it's completely square. Uh, the edges were very. Um, uh, uh, pronounced and it we it feels it we didn't have complaints but people the they it was it was so such a hard press that uh, it was hard on your mouth mm -hmm. and uh, so we went to a soft press and I was gonna say that because it definitely has like a smoother softer exactly elegance to it exactly yeah. and uh, the the re the response we're getting from uh, tobacconists across the country and, and consumers are amazing. Mm -hmm. and, it, and one of the reasons is because it was off the market for about uh, about six months. Okay. And uh, so we're getting uh, getting calls, we're getting uh, from, from consumers and retailers, tobacconists, like you say, around from around the country. They, they love this. And um, what we did too was we came out with a third variation of, of the Prola de Mar. And it was a Corojo. It's a, a wrapper grown by the Oliva Tobacco Company, mm -hmm. John Oliva and Johnito in Tampa. And uh, the tobacco was grown in Ecuador. And the Corojo has, it's a, we've, we've never used Corojo. Uh, I, I, so I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. I, go, I don't think I've ever heard of, yeah, of yeah. J.C. Newman using Corojo. Exactly. And uh, it has a unique taste, uh, mm -hmm. very pleasing. I love it. I, I love cigars, uh, ob obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all do, and hopefully, hopefully your listeners and, and your people that watch the show as well. But um, so it's uh, the Corojo. That's we're getting incredible re response from. Uh, that people just going ga goo goo or, or <laughs> right. gaga over yeah. it's it's adding it. a little different of a layer. Yeah, yeah it's adding, adding just taste, just, just yeah. that just yeah. that little bit of, a little bit of spice. Now, how long did that that cigar, um, like that, you know, with the Corojo, you know, um, was that a long process of of producing a, a new or you know, you know, it's Olive tobacco. I mean, those, those we had them on our on our live show. Right. Just fan, you know, the knowledge they have on tobacco. Yeah. Well, you know, working with them, I imagine, you know, you tell them you want something, it's a pretty fast, you know. It, it is, but uh, they, 
it takes us at, at least two years for us to come out with a new cigar. Mm -hmm. So the, the Pearl de Mar Corojo was like a new cigar for us, although we did get a running start because the Pearl de Mar, uh, the brand has been, had been already out there. Mm -hmm. But to get the blending, if we took the wrapper, then we have to blend you know, the right binder and the right combination of the long fillers, to, long filler tobaccos. Right. And it takes us at least two years to come out with, uh, it was like a new brand for us, a new segment, the, the Pearl de Mar Corojo. Yeah, cause a lot of people just think that, you know, when you, when you want to come out with a new cigar and with a new wrapper, you just put a Corojo wrapper on an existing cigar and then you're done. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that every bit of the cigar has to function and, and you know, together. It is. And what takes so long for us is that when we make it with, well, we'll make samples, we'll smoke them right away. Obviously, the cigar changes, but we won't make the final decision as far as to the the blend for at least six months because that's what it, we feel like it takes at least six months for the tobaccos to marry and just like with uh, bourbon uh, if you a uh, if you were to sample you go to uh, Kentucky and you take take a sample of a bourbon that's uh, six weeks old or, or even a year old it's gonna taste a lot different eight oh, years later absolutely. just tremendously and that's the way cigars are and that's this is such a great industry I love the people we love you. No, thank we, we, you. Thank you for what you, because you're, you're helping the industry. And by this, it's so important. And of course, COVID has been a disaster for our country, but it did uh, allow my brother and me and, and Drew, uh, my nephew, Eric's son, to, to be on these wonderful uh, podcasts. Oh, right. And there's the so Zooms. much interest yeah, in, in, in the Zooms oh. and, and podcasts and so I forth. really feel like as, as much as COVID has obviously had its major negative effects on society. It also has brought people together in ways that they never would have had time otherwise to do. And I think that's important, you know, that we celebrate that in a sense, you know. It, it is. And funny, Jessica, this is, t t here we are, January 2021. This is our 126th year. Mm. And, um, we had uh, we, we knew that recessions and depressions were a, really a friend of the cigar industry and liquor industry, right. and we also knew that um, uh, the, the last COVID, the last pandemic, I'm sorry, was in 1918. Right. There's no one alive to say, hey, how did cigars perform? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but we do know, like during the last recession, back with 2008, 2009, uh, people um, they traded down, but they did smoke more cigars. Oh. Yeah. And yeah. so th this has been uh, um, a, an unusual 2020, and this COVID yeah. still going on has been a very unusual year. But one thing about great about cigars is that you go into, uh, you can go because during the, p the pandemic, most of like I think every cigar lounge uh, in America is closed, mm -hmm. but uh, you still can smoke out. So you have to do social distancing, but before COVID, you go into any cigar lounge. You walk. It doesn't matter if if male, female, black, purple, white. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You sit down next to that person, mm -hmm. and you, you're already you already establish a you will establish a relationship because you these are not cigarettes. You have to. It takes it's gonna take an hour to smoke this, and it's cigars, premium cigars, handmade cigars slow you down automatically. Oh, absolutely. It, it doesn't, and, and it brings everybody together. I, I've been in a, in a lounge where, you know, you, you have multi-millionaires, you've got people that don't have anything, you've got every, every in, you know, all in between, all religions, all political, and you know, and it's just, and even on, on politics, it's, you know, on online and on social media, you know, everybody fights. When you get into a lounge, you actually have decent conversations with people, you know, that, that have varying opinions, you know, and it's just, so it it's just this. When, when yeah. Something happens when yeah. you pick this up. So. <laughs> you know, it just brings everything, everything together. And you talked about all the the zooms and all the virtual hearse. This has been the great. 2020 was the greatest year I think for the cigar smoker, because I've been in these mm -hmm. you know uh, zooms and, and hearse with with people, and then all of a sudden, you know, like like Steve Saka will pop in. Mm -hmm. You'll you'll pop in. We've seen right. you. We've seen Jonathan Drew. We've right. seen all, and it's just we we've never had that yeah. access to the because you guys are busy during a normal year right, and that's what you, you all are busy so so now everybody's on their computer 
It's you know? pretty impressive. I think it gave um, cigar smokers who also maybe have never been to like an event or you know are not able to get to like a lounge and stuff, right. um, or new cigar smokers kind of seeing um, the faces of their favorite cigars or cigars that they're trying out out in the public eye like that, and they can be accessible and ask questions. And I think that was really like a cool thing to see in the cigar industry. Oh, it, you abso- know? Absolutely. And I, I do want to go back and say why I mentioned podcasts. I met Zooms. We've been on so many Zooms yeah. Oh, yeah. from around yeah. the world, yeah. from Mexico, I mean, United States, and Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, um, uh, Europe, so Europe, and so forth. And then fighting the, t- the time. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I, I was just I was just on one at, at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, and then it was someone from Australia, and he had just gotten up. Right. You know, right. he, he hadn't even had breakfast yet, and then right. he was on with us and talking about our uh, um, our cigars. Cool. All right, so so during the shutdown, you, you never stopped working on the factory. Yeah. And, and then here, here we are right now. This is actually where they roll the American. Exactly. Um, and people can see there are two stations set up behind me, but there are but there are more, two working stations. Actually, three three stations we're adding. We have oh, three yeah, hand cigar three makers. Yeah, like right. That. And we're on the third floor. Actually, this is the fourth floor because uh, all the cigar factories in Tampa, which were built between 1886 and 1910, uh, had every one of them had basements. The only basements that we know in Florida are here. Well, I was going to say, I never ever anywhere else in Florida except for here in Tampa I've heard those basements because I'm originally from New Jersey, so, you know, I'm used to having oh, sure. basements. And right. when I moved to Florida, I was like, what? How is there no basements here? Uh, oh, but it makes sense. It, it does. <laughs> so, uh, this, this whole idea of this massive uh, restoration slash renovation was Drew. Eric Sons, uh, who is our uh, is our uh, attorney mm-hmm. and um, and also uh, the creator of the Cigar Family uh, website. This was his idea, and, and I want to tell you a quick 30-second story. Um, I was with, we took our family, two sons, Dawson and Paxton, and my wife out to California 12 years ago, and we had, um, uh, we went up, to, up and down the coast, and we were in San Francisco, and we saw where they were making sourdough bread downtown and we we you could smell it and it was a huge place it was beautiful it was like a factory restaurant all glass and you could see them making the sourdough bread which kept with San Francisco was famous for I told my wife and my children I said it wouldn't be great someday if we could make cigars by hand in our factory in Tampa you know that'll never happen unfortunately <laughs> so it took I'm the third generation the fourth generation drew this was his idea let's open the factory to the public let's it's it's not only for our family but let's Tampa has been so good to us Mm -hmm. and we've been here since 1954 Grandpa JC started the company in Cleveland Ohio in 1895 Tampa was at the epicenter Uh, this Tampa when we moved here they were making 500 there were 10 large factories plus smaller ones but the 10 large ones were making over 500 million cigars a year 500 million using Cuban wrapper binder fill that's impressive and then 1961 the embargo came and that broke the back. We heard Tampa, a lot of factories that merged, closed, or, or, or moved out of here, like right. Garcia Vega. They, uh, at one time, was a very was a premium cigar. That was, and, was in and, Tampa at yeah. those times, all those big cigar makers. Right. And there's Perfecto wow. Garcia across the street, and, and Gold Label is across is on the other side of the interstate, and yeah. Tampa, and Villazon, uh, Frankie Neza, and uh, so you have a tamp on Toro Fuente and 22nd Street. Oh, okay. So uh, we're the last of the Mohicans, yep. it, so to speak. But So what Drew's vision was to not only do something, open the, the factory, it had this massive restoration, renovation, but also to start making cigars. Uh, on the third floor, and uh, or, or fourth floor, we call this the third floor. Yeah. <laughs> so Eric, my brother, and Drew's son said, "Listen, if you want to spend your inheritance, go ahead. We'll do it." <laughs> and um, we kind of got a tongue in cheek, but it's to make cigars in the United States by hand is is hard. It, obviously, the labor is a lot more than it is in Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic. But it's Drew's vision that let's we'll make cigars. We'll 
passive restoration. Um, and let's turn this into the Bourbon Trail. So when people come to Tampa, pre-COVID, uh, about eight blocks from here, there are four, there were four large cruise ships. And uh, right now the cruise industry is, is still uh, dormant, unfortunately, until, we, until the virus, until this vaccine hits. But uh, uh, Tampa, we get two, the state of Florida gets over two million Canadians every year. Yes, they do. And people come to Tampa and they, the, the first thing they want to see are cigars. Oh, yeah. Cigar city. <laughs> Oh yeah, and, they, um, they want to they want to see the action. <laughs> yeah. So this is this this is our gift back to the city as well. I say the city's been very good uh, to us and for us and with us, and um, also. Uh, we're going to start having hand cigar making classes here on the third floor. Oh, that is start sweet. blending. So you come in. Um, we, we have a docent downstairs, uh, Holden Rasmussen, and he's getting his master's and his PhD in history. He's a great storyteller. That's, a, and, that's uh, awesome. And Nick is down there as well. Um, and so we we knew there was a lot of interest, but even in this, here we are in the middle of the, well, the, hopefully the end of the pandemic, there's still, there's people coming in. We give tours three days a week, Monday, Thursday, and Friday, from 9.30, they're an hour and a half mm -hmm. tours, from 9, at 9.30, 11.30, and 1.30. And we're booked through March. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and I think that, like, it's just so neat to be able to, like, share the history. I mean, it's, like, it's just so beautifully done, too. Like just looking at everything in the detail and it gives people a sense to connect like, you know, like, wow, like I'm smoking this cigar that, you know, some of the stuff you were talking about with the molds and everything, like this is where it kind of comes from. So I think that's really you know, neat so people can get that visual effect, you know. Exactly. When people come in here, uh, my brother says it all, says it's all the time. It's like stepping back in time. It is, yes. And it is. This factory is uh, uh, now 111 years old, built in 1910. And we uh, make cigars by hand. And then we brought down from, we brought from Ohio, mm -hmm. these hand operated uh, cigar machines. And uh, they were made by American Machine Foundry when we were all little, you'd go to the bowling alley and right above the pins it said AMF. Oh, yeah. That stood for American Machine and Foundry. Okay. They made all these cigar, uh, these hand operated machines between 1931 and 1934. Oh. The stripping machines were made in 1910 and you can look at the brass, it's the original brass is there and as the people from General Motors or, or Detroit will tell you a, 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 a car will last forever if you take care of it. There's still Model A's and Model, Model T's around our cellophane machines uh, were, were made in 1917 and so that the original frame the parts were out we, we have we have five full-time mechanics here we have a machine shop uh, and as, that right there too is a dying art people oh, yeah. knowing how to work on some of these older machines I mean that's no, you, you're right and it's why we've had a handful of, of people come from Cuba and uh, who they're so good with their hands I, I love mechanics. Yeah. I am not one. My father <laughs> was. That's one of the reasons I love you. Yeah. <laughs> but my father was a mechanic. He was on, on a B-24 Liberator um, during World War II. And um, he was a master mechanic for those radial engines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure yeah. some of your listeners and oh, viewers wow. are, know this. And the radial engines, they, they use so much oil. And every time they came back um, from a mission or a test run, um, they they that's it. They had to lift. They had to open up the the, the, the cover of the entire engine and look at it because it was the whole thing was always covered in oil. Oh, so you wow. had to get the oil to see what other challenges there may be. Yeah, you know, in talking with Jeff over uh, Corona and, uh, and on and on the farm, you know, he you know his dad was a, a yeah, mechanic as, as well, and and he had learned some things because you know when you're you know like on the older machines and Jeff's got some older machines and equipment, they don't, they don't make parts for it. You just gotta you gotta improvise you gotta do and you gotta keep these things yeah. keep these things going yeah, that is true you know and and the one interesting thing I found you know you talk about going back in history well you know when I, I got the tour right before you guys you know shut down for your renovation and then I came you know halfway through and saw everything tore apart it was interesting to see the history of what 
when people covered stuff up, you know, it's like we, we you know, we, we talked to our grandparents about why would you put linoleum over this, this, right. this beautiful hard wood and like, well, that, that linoleum is beautiful. Right. You know, it was right. just wood, you know, so, you know, you got to see the walls, but you know, and that was just what they thought the thing was, you know, yeah, just, you just, yeah. just throw up some drywall and some plywood over these ugly windows that cranked out. And then right. just, and then you look at the windows and you're, you were like, how, how did you ever cover up that beauty? But that's, that's just the time. It was the time if you go down, down in uh, our offices, you can see where the addition was put on in 1965 by our father, Stanford. <clears throat> But we never had, I don't remember seeing the old factory. We used to come here in the 50s on Saturday. That's where people work six days a week. Right. Eric and I would come in on Saturdays and you know, we'd uh, uh, do drawings or may, do little homework <laughs> or whatever. Our dad worked and he'd sit in his office or someone else's office. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right, the plywood, everything uh, was cut. It was beautiful as we're here, this beautiful uh, brick. From that was, was made in 19, actually 1909. It was, all, it was all covered, and those those, those big windows, and, and it was drop ceilings became very popular. In the yeah. I know. We've, got, yeah. we've done away and then with all, all that. And you open it all up. And uh, you're oh, like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, um, at one time, there were 1,500 um, cigar workers in here, and uh, they. Uh, if this place could talk, you know, even where we are now, yeah. and, uh, it's, um, it's, this, this is a, every business is tough, but this is a fun industry. Mm -hmm. My father used to say, we're lucky because the products that we, that we manufacture, they go up in smoke, literally. Yeah. So they have to repeat it. We, yeah. We're not selling automobiles that last for five years or 10 years or airplanes, whatever. Uh, but going back to the Pearl of Mar, we've had, um, the what we're smoking, the Maduro version is Connecticut Broadleaf, and not a lot of use, not a lot of people use Connecticut Broadleaf because it's terribly short, terrible short supply. It's got a unique taste, uh, it's, and uh, the uh, the Corojo with his new Corojo wrapper. I had smoked uh, some of our <clears throat> competitors' uh, Corojo cigars. Mm -hmm. They were very, very good. And to put it on our own product was is a dream uh, for us uh, to, to be able to do that and blend it to the way we think it, where it's flavorful, uh, uh, spicy, won't blow your head off mm -hmm. type of thing. And then on the uh, the Perla de Mar, uh, the shade, it's a Connecticut seed grown in Ecuador. Oh, okay. And people, it's a very, very smooth uh, tasting cigar. It's got a lot of flavor, a lot of undertones to it. Okay. Now, now where, I was going to say, this is a pretty smooth cigar too, though. Mm -hmm. It has the more boldness in right. it, but it's just, everything about this is just, the smoke is even so creamy. It's just really nice richness there. That yeah, I, and uh, people can see as I'm smoking, it's yeah, hovering it's, in it's, Jessica's face. It's, it's such a creamy, right. Right. it's a heavy smoke, and it's it's just a, a great, it's got this, this wonderful toothy wrapper. It's got a spice that's not overpowering, no, and it's, it's just, it just um, plays. Yeah, where, where where is this one made? What what uh, the factory where this, this one is, is made? made in Pensa, our factory in Nicaragua, okay. and we make about ninety five to hundred thousand cigars a day there. We make brick house, Pearl Del Mar, mm -hmm. we make the quorum cigars, the house handmaids, um, and it's. Um, when, again, the Oliva Tobacco Company, John Oliva Sr. and Johnito, we remember his father. Um, we used to have cigars made by a different factory. We had the corn made by a factory in Nicaragua, and um, we were afraid that they were going to sell out to the big boys and they would we'd be out. Mm -hmm. So Eric and I went to uh, John Oliva and uh, expressed our concerns, and uh, he said, listen, we, we can help you with that. So they identified, they found that the right property, uh, it's very large, and when we built the factory, it, it, the capacity was between 40 and 50,000 cigars a day, and that's what we were making, and uh, fortunately, the property is large enough, we've had 
about five and five or six additions to it. And probably the most important addition we made was was in 2019 is uh, we built a, a, a second warehouse. So can, there's no such you don't buy aged tobacco. You buy it. You have to age it yourself. And the longer you age tobacco, the smoother it gets. Again, it's like scotch. Right. A, a, a 50 year old scotch, like a, like a Johnny Walker Blue label, very very smooth versus uh, one that's maybe 10 years old. And when we learned that uh, from uh, the, the our business, our Dominican business partners, the Fuentes, who I believe have I don't know this for a fact, they have the largest. Uh, and I would swear on my parents' grave, and they're, they're buried about eight minutes from here. The, the, the fourth is that they have the largest stockholding of aged tobacco oh, by far in, probably, in, in the world. I can believe that. So, so that well, that's really the, the secret of the, of the, the cigars, mm -hmm. of, of aging. The, these cigars are aged uh, anywhere from four to six months, and uh, but the tobacco is, is, is been aged three to four years. And wow. So we're, we're now we're making a big investment. We're, we're buying tobacco, wrapper binder filler, and just storing it. We want to age it properly and, and longer, just to make a better cigar. Mm -hmm. So next, I mean, this is, uh, to me, very it's a delicious cigar, but it'll, it'll be better next year and the following year. Right, the following as it year. ages, right. as, it as, the tobacco, it kind of as the tobaccos get older yeah. and, 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 uh, as well. So it's, a, um, it's there are in many ways to cut the corner. You can, this, this Connecticut broadleaf, it comes in into a factory in Nicaragua, PENSA, mm -hmm. stands for, every factory in Nicaragua has a name. Um, the PENSA means, means in, in English means, it's, it's uh, well, in Spanish it's pearls. Okay. Um, the Esteli uh, Nicaragua. Okay. So it's, it stands for cigars of Esteli, and an SA is, is incorporated. Incorporated. I didn't. I was always wondering what that. I, you know, I never I looked up ask. what SA yeah. always right. stood for. I just mm -hmm. I didn't know that just meant mm -hmm. incorporated. Okay. So 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 you are masters of construction. You've gone through. Uh, you know, you've expanded your factory down there, expanded up here. So you you've really gotten the hang of. Well, it's, it's every, <laughs> yeah. whatever. It's kind of like if when you if you're going to re if you're going to remodel your home, but they say it's going to take you six months and yes. X. You we know you got to double that. I'm like, <laughs> we, we, know know. we, uh, we yeah. just did an addition on our, our house. Our six we, months we took a year. So, uh, it took about a year and a, and a half. Yeah, you know. A year and a half so, to be fair. Yeah. But right. it was it was worth it. And uh, we're about to almost do it again. Yeah. We're going to add on a little bit more to do an actual bigger cigar lounge. Because right now nice. we kind of have a little studio cigar lounge, but it's small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we have the space and the the yard and the ability to do it so Oh, probably another year from now. Yeah. yeah. So 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 during yeah. So during the construction of this, were there any? I mean, the building is old. Were there any surprises? Oh, like like your engineering yeah. came back and said, you know what? This is we tore down this wall and this is here. Yes. You know. It's funny you say that. There were two big surprises. The biggest one was, and Eric and I had never seen this in my I don't know, and Dad never talked about it, but in the, in the basement, um, we found a a doorway. And in, in, in the basement, that's where we put our uh, IRS records, and that's where we kept our uh, for U.S. Customs. Mm -hmm. We keep our things for seven years. And as we were inking it out, we found this doorway. We opened it up. It was spooky. It's like something out of a Hollywood movie because when we opened it up, the wood inside looked brand new. Oh. And, and where where was it going? So it was heading to upstairs, uh, a little office next to our a main conference room. Uh, the main conference room at one time was uh, before we bought the factory. We bought this factory in 1953 and moved in 1954. So, uh, the little office belonged to, we found out, belonged to the plant manager. Okay. And that the reason that that secret door was there, it was a getaway because the mafia was very strong in the 30s. Oh wow! All the in their 1,500 uh, hand cigar makers and other workers in this factory up until 1950. 
And then the, the company that owned this, uh, the Regensburg company, they moved to Philadelphia. And they later become, became Phillies and merged with Garcia Vega. Everything has a story. So why, why was that track door there? Because we found out in the 30s, all the uh, cigar makers, were paid, all the workers were paid with, by cash. Mm -hmm. So once a month, uh, the mafia would pick a factory and they would go rob it. Yeah. So the trap door was put, it was, it was built in there. So it, when you, hey, we got, we're going to be, uh, the mafia's coming to, to, to get the money. Yeah. So the, the manager would take the money, the plant manager, and he would go downstairs. And we found the second thing, the second place we didn't know. There was a hidden, and it was full of it was boxes in, in front of it uh, until we started the reconstruction. Uh, it was a safe. And he would go and, uh, and you couldn't see the safe. It doesn't look like a safe. And apparently, the story goes, they had they just kept boxes in front of it, even before we bought the factory. So those were the two big, big, big surprises. The third one that would be, uh, I remember my grandfather in his office, it was just after he died, we turned to a conference room. Uh, I never, Eric and I never knew there were windows in there until so we pulled off, all the, all the, pulled down the wall. The, uh, it actually it was paneling, the Grandpa JC, beautiful oh, okay. paneling. And we pulled it off, it was, it was beautiful brick, and there was a drop ceiling that, that, <laughs> that Dad and Grandpa put in back in the, in the early 50s. Yeah, that was the look. And so, and they had these huge windows, and the windows had, they looked like hurricane shutters that would come down. Wow, because, so and uh, were, um, so, we, so as it, in this the remodeling renovation, we just, we brought the factory back to what it looked like in 1910. That's and, uh, the way it should always look. It's yeah. just simply stunning and beautiful. I mean, I know that times made people decide to, you know, decorate differently, right. but this is just gorgeous how everything turned out. It really is, just bringing it back to its roots. I love it. Well, well thank you. And w w one of the uh, special things that Eric had found was a re the audio of Grandpa JC. So we have a little, a small, uh, a small movie theater on the second floor, cool. and you can. It's, if you, it would take you ten hours to look at all the videos on there, but it's uh, Adria, our social media uh, digital marketing expert, set the whole thing up along with Kara Guardo, and uh, it is state of the art. You just you go up to large screens, and you can push a button. And push a button. You can hear a father. Uh, before about a year before Dad, Dad died in 2006 he was 90 years old in 12 weeks and he was in my brother's office I had taken my wife and two boys to a, a, a YMCA camp in North Carolina so I wasn't here so dad was in Eric's office again 90 years old 12 weeks and he was raising hell about one of our customers yeah. it wasn't paying us and <laughs> damn it, his heart stopped mm. it was uh, and he had, he'd exercised just like his father, who died here at the age of 83. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but Dad went out with his boots on, yep. drove himself to Doing work. what he loved to do. Uh, exactly. And uh, people, so people, when they would tell that story, I always say that, so now you know what our retirement program is. <laughs> right. We work, we work till we drop dead. Right. In here. Yeah. <laughs> at least uh, being alive that long, though, like just the stories he probably had to be able to pass down is what made, like, because I had a, a great grandmother that lived to be 90, and so she, and she came from Germany, and she used to tell us these incredible stories of what she had seen, and, and um, you know, you can't ever get that from anybody that, you know, hasn't lived from that time, so now you have it also, re like, recordings of things that he was saying, so that's so cool. It, it is, it's, and, and uh, according to her grandmother, Grandpa J.C. was born in 1875. He was born 10 years after the American Civil War. And I remember him very well. Uh, he died in 1958. 
and I was seven years old, so now everyone knows how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> but what happened is that because Eric and I and Grandpa JC, we all got married very late in life, mm -hmm. so we like skipped a generation. And uh, I was 43 when my first child was born, yeah. and at 46 for the second child. So that's why, but Grandpa JC, I remember, I remember well, we used to go, his, Eric and I would go to their house uh, and my mom and dad on Sundays, and this, I never realized what a, he was from Hungary. Okay. And uh, he came in 18, uh, 1888, landed in Baltimore, and I uh, didn't have a middle name. His, mm. his name was Julius Neumann. Oh, that's interesting. That was my grandfather's name. <laughs> he came off. Julius? Julius. Really? Mm -hmm. must yep. have, and where was your grandfather from? From Germany. They, okay. they, he came over, they came over when he was a small, small right. child. Right. Yeah, so that's interesting. It, it is. He didn't have a middle name either. Okay. You can see, and he spoke uh, most most of the people coming from Europe, they ended up at Ellis Island. Yep. For some reason, Grandpa JC went through Baltimore. He spoke German and, uh, and Hungarian, and through a translator, uh, he said that you have to have a middle name to come in the country, so we're going to give you one. And Grandpa JC was very short for his age. Uh, so they said, we're going to call you, you could be, your middle name will be Caesar, you'll be Julius Caesar Newman. Oh, boy. And Grandpa JC had a big ego. He Love that. Oh, and, I'm sure. Uh, and they, they, they misspelled Caesar, though. And so when we came out with the the Diamond Crown Julius Caesar to, to honor his 135th birthday, and we put these cigars in leather boxes. It, 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 it's, it's a very, very well made cigar. A great cigar. Oh, Highest rated cigar ever made. Cigar. Made by Arturo Fuente. So they, in the Dominican Republic, um, we sent the ad to Cigar Aficionado in, in, in C20. 10. And they said, they called us and said, you misspelled Caesar. You know, <laughs> no, we did. That's the way it's you know, that that's the way his, on his passport. Yeah. And we, we had a lot of fun with that. And it's it's a wonderful cigar. Uh, every That's what I love so much about the cigar business. Every, every brand, every manufacturer has a story. Mm -hmm. And there's, there, there's still uh, a lot of the industries gravitated towards uh, lar these large multinational European companies. But there's still a lot a lot of folks to be uh, small ones left. Mm -hmm. and they all have wonderful stories. Yep. And uh, as you know, you've interviewed probably yeah. all of them. Yeah, it's <laughs> it, 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 it seems like it. Between so. you and Jesse, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which, which is which is interesting. But um, the um, we're going, but we're going back to the pro of the mar. It is um, uh, we, we, you can, because. We've been sitting here since March. I usually travel, but in 2019, I was gone 40 weeks. Oh, wow. Which meant I was gone one day, two week, two days, or, or a whole week yeah. even out of it. So uh, we didn't realize that how much uh, excitement there was because we had all, all we could just go to the local tobacco shops in, in the area in Orlando and so forth. But um, anyway, we're. we're uh, uh, we, were, we were excited about the cigar, but you never know until you put it back. Because again, uh, it's the same blend, it's just that you know, with the new boxes and bands, but right. with the, the press, the, we're getting that great, wonderful feedback that people love this soft press, soft Tampa slash e press. <laughs> yeah. So now that the renovations are finished, what is one of your favorite parts of the factory? And I'll answer that with, with talking to Carlito yesterday uh, on our Zoom sales meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, with all of our regional sales managers from around the country, coast to coast. And I was telling Carlito, reminding him of the story. The first cigar dinner I ever did was with Carlito, Carlos Fuente, in 1988 in Sarasota. So we're sitting there. Um, if you can imagine, those cigar dinners were unheard of back then. This was before Cigar Aficionado, before the boom. So we're, so we're, we're, we're talking to about 100 people in the room. And someone asked Carlito, I said, Mr. Fuente, what is your favorite cigar? 
and he thought about it. He said, his answer was, how do you choose among your, your children? <laughs> so I'd have to say, how do you choose among your children? The space is here. Because the in, on the first floor uh, is a cigar museum. And that's been my brother and, and his labor of love. And he did, he worked with, with Kira Guarnado. And um, we, had, we had a museum that, for, that, that, that was put downstairs in 2004. This museum is like, it's like something out of the Smithsonian. It's the story of our family and uh, from DC to um, uh, to our Cleveland era, to the Tampa era, to to the uh, the famous um, at the time the first cigar bar in the history of Major League Baseball was where the where the Tampa Bay Devil Rays played, <laughs> yeah. and uh, the Quest Ray Cigar Bar. So we have uh, remnants of that, and uh, then the Fuente. Uh, we got together with 1986 with Arturo Fuente. That's a fascinating story, I think. Anyway, and then. Uh, and it, it, then the Nicar it's got a, the, an area about Nicaragua. Oh, okay. It's got with videos that you can see that are the hand cigar makers in Esteli, making Brickhouse and Pro de Mar, and ends up with with the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation. There's their photos and, and yeah. videos of what's at least the school that Eric and Carlito uh, and Drew uh, started, and there's about 460, 470 kindergartners through 12th graders. I love that. Which is just uh, so amazing. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite movies, and, and I, I quote Carlito, which I rarely do, but uh, <laughs> build it and they will come. Yep. And uh, if we had done a visit to quote my my brother Carlito if we had done a, had a business plan we never would have done it because we didn't know what we were doing we bought this property uh, and it was in a flood zone we didn't know that so we had to go back and spend a quarter of a million dollars on French drains I know you know what a French oh, yes, drain we, we just we just put one in our house uh, <laughs> and you know all about yep. that and we do yes and uh, so we went to Cigar Aficionado and we were looking we needed support mm -hmm. and Cigar Aficionado uh, gave us uh, very nice sum to the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, and we built a, a state-of-the-art baseball uh, field and stadium. That's great. And, uh, and then uh, we went to some local people, restaurant people, who gave us a, a nice chunk, and we built a kitchen down there. So we were able to provide the, the students down there mm -hmm. uh, shoes, uniforms, and two hot meals a day. And then it gets better. I love that you add weight. Yeah. <laughs> There's more. Yeah. So we built a medical clinic. Eric had gotten together with, uh, uh, I won't mention any names, some people from Texas. Mm -hmm. We had a large foundation, and they, they uh, helped support so enough, gave us enough funds so we could build a medical clinic. So we got there, no one had ever seen a toothbrush. Yeah. And so when, they have, so when the kids and the parents would have a, a cavity, they just... Pull they just pull it. The get yep. flyers and pull it. Now we have two dentists, and and this the the, the the cycle of life. One of the students started there as a second grader. His name is Nelson. He went to med school. And he's now the physician. He's our medical oh, director. That's so great. And uh, Eric and I are in the Rotary Club. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we are to get some grants because the water's all is is bad down there. Mm -hmm. uh, bad meaning that for drinking, <clears throat> and, and where we are, cigar family at the school. Uh, Eric and Carlito were driving around in, in, in around 2000. And they saw these kids at, at, at 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, five and six year old kids, seven year. Well, why weren't they in school? Well, they weren't. The reason they weren't in school, there was only one school for the whole area, 5,000 people. Look, Look like a little house on the prairie. There's a room of smaller than this, and there's one light bulb hanging down, and they put all the first graders through the sixth graders in there, which oh. means they learned nothing. Nothing, yeah. So we, we said, well, let's just build our own school. And, um, and that was, we opened it in 2004, and um, that 98 percent of the kids graduate go on to college college these public universities are free mm -hmm. the reason more people do not go is because they can't afford the books and the transportation so we help them with that as well oh, that's cool. so we've been able to change the whole culture uh, rotary gave us some really nice grants that we were able to to drill deep water wells in the community 
community, in these communities. These are the, the people who live up in the mountains. Are, are, most Americans have traveled outside the United States, have seen poverty. Mm -hmm. But these people are so poor they can't even afford outhouses. Right. So when with the, so when we came in, we were able to, uh, so to it's, it's educate really them. So it's really like a nomadic type of lifestyle that they're living in a sense. Well, it's a kind of hand to mouth. Yeah. Thing, yes. And uh, it's uh, our goal is to break the, the chains of poverty. Yeah. And you do that through education yeah. and also education. through and through through through, uh, through health, mm -hmm. taking care of uh, individuals' health. I and agree. Uh, so it's um, it's it's been a wonderful ride and, and it continues. And we have the fourth generation coming in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eric and I are as our vice president of operations. Uh, says uh, Rich Dolak, he says we're in our fourth quarter. Well, I think we're in the fourth quarter of our life, but we think we're in triple overtime. <laughs> so, so That's it's true. All, all good stuff. That is good. But the you asked me going back in favorite okay. part. I mean, I love it. Here we are in this, this hand cigar making area. Drew's idea and to come out to make cigars. First, first brand will be the American, which is the first brand coincidentally out of this factory. And so we're gonna we're gonna his vision was to make the cigar using 100 percent American grown tobacco, wrapper, binder, filler, the boxes we made in America, the cellophane, the ink, the cigar bands, the cigar labels, mm -hmm. everything is made in America. And we thought, Eric and I thought he was out of his mind. And here we have uh, the rollers behind us making the American. And it's, in a, it's maybe in a hundred uh, shops. Uh, each each roller only, we, they only allowed to make a hundred cigars yes. a day. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, <know. laughs> I, I think that, I think it's everybody's everybody's, everybody's favorite this cigar out. <laughs> well, we could not have done this without Jeff Borshowitz oh, yeah. from Corona. Amazing. Another person I tried to talk out of, but he said he's going to build a uh, a. Uh, a, uh, start growing tobacco uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in Florida. So mm -hmm. he's started in Claremont. He's in Claremont, yep. Florida, just north of Disney World. And you go there and you see a tobacco barn. It, it defies logic. It Here does. We are, Central Florida. <laughs> you know, we're near Disney, Walt Disney World, and mm -hmm. Universal Studios. And here we are. And um, Jeff did this. He calls it Florida Sun Grow. Yep. And so the FSG. Uh, right, FSG. <laughs> and uh, so we buy all the tobacco, we bring it down to Pensa, Nicaragua, we pick out the wrappers, and then the rest goes to uh, to Drew Estate, and we make Jeff's Florida Sun Grove cigar. Yep, and it's a good cigar, too. It's funny, the, the great, another irony is that uh, long filler tobacco, it's hard, it's hard for us to find someone to grow, who grows long filler in the United States. So we found the, the Mennonites and the Amish. Yes, in so Pennsylvania we, there. In Pennsylvania, so we have the Amish grow, and we bought tobacco, long filler tobaccos from them, and aged it, and the wrap, the, the, the filler, the long filler we were growing was too thick, it wasn't, it wasn't burning right with this combination of the Florida Sun Grown and the Connecticut Broadleaf that we're using, mm -hmm. so we switched to the Mennonites. The great irony, as you know, and your listeners know, that the Mennonites and the Amish, they don't use electricity, they don't, you know, it's horse and buggy, and yep. it's, it's going back, and, uh, and the reason they apparently it's it's okay for them to grow tobacco, cigar tobacco. But they, they love growing cigar tobacco. They get more dollars per acre oh. versus growing hay or corn oh, or okay. tomato or what, whatever. And uh, so so it's worked out worked out very well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we were lucky to be able to go to the Pennsylvania Barn Smoker mm. um, through Drew State and see like their process. Just to and, see the process of them growing the, the, the tobacco. Me too. Oh. It's so cool. It, it, it's fascinating here because they're doing things. Uh, John Foster is one of the, the growers up there. He's a sixth generation. Oh, wow. He can trace his roots back to the, the late 1700s. I, I met John. What a great guy. Oh, what, what a great guy. And the, you know, and the history behind that. So we're making cigars uh, behind us mm -hmm. the same way uh, when Christopher Columbus, very similar, when Christopher Columbus landed in 1492, as we all learned that in <laughs> yeah. elementary school. Right. And he saw these natives, they were smoking a, a plant. And uh, that's the first known that we know. Uh, 
a sighting of uh, of a of a of a west of a of a European seeing right. uh, tobacco cigars being smoked. It was, it, was a cigar. Oh, it was done for ceremony, same like today, mm -hmm. celebrations for ceremonies, special ceremonies, some special times. Yeah. And uh, it's funny the. Uh, we, the industry has been up and down uh, over over the last 200 years. The cigar industry. Remember, my father tell me that um, the, the when Grandpa J.C. started 18 started this 1895. 80 uh, percent of American males smoked cigars. Can you imagine that? Today is maybe seven to ten percent. Yeah. Yeah. But, so things were going great until the First World War. First World War. If you've heard the story, Dad used to say this is what happened to the industry, because during World War One, the American Red Cross used to send to the Doughboys, mm -hmm. called, which were American troops. We sent several million over there in World War World War. Uh, one, uh, 1916, they left as cigar smokers, but the American Red Cross had sent them cigarettes and oh, yeah. in all the care packages, and they, you know, one knew that about cigarettes. Yeah. They came back as cigarette smokers. That was the first downturn of the cigar industry. Yeah, because of the tobacco from right. the cigarettes. And, uh, the <laughs> right. and uh, but now it's interesting. When I got in the business, I used to I started part time in 1969, working with a distributor salesman around around the Florida area, and well, you know. My father used to say, only old men, it, it seemed like only old men smoke cigars, probably people your age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think it's relevant funny. about the thing. Oh, but um, the, today, you never see a woman around a cigar shop. Mm -hmm. Very, very rarely. Now you go pre COVID, pre pandemic, yeah. you go into a cigar lounge and you see a lot of women in there too, yeah, which definitely. is wonderful. And the age too. Quick story, uh, I was in West, I was in Palm Beach working with uh, Eli Witt, one of our distributors, okay. and we were selling cigars to the Breakers Hotel, that beautiful old 1920 uh, magnificent hotel. We were driving in in an on-air conditioned cars in the middle of the summer. I saw this young fella, he was probably 18, 19 years old, and he was playing croquet uh, in his front lawn. Obviously a very wealthy uh, blue blood uh, <laughs> person, and he had an ascot on. Okay. And he looked ridiculous. I'm, I'm <laughs> working with the salesman, I said, who does he think he is? And the reason I'm telling you the story is that it was the same way. If you saw someone 21, mm -hmm. 25, uh, 18, smoking a cigar, they look ridiculous. Like, like are you, and today, it's, it's, thank God, it, it's, it's common. It's a, it's a very healthy industry. Yeah, my, my son, who is, is in the military, he's right. 22, he's stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and he went to one of your events there. Right, one of his first. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was so excited. He won a he hat, won a, a J.C. Hat. Newman oh, hat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so it was interesting, though, because he's kind of got some buddies that are kind of just now learning to kind of how to you know smoke cigars, what they like, right. what they don't like. But it's neat because there's the camaraderie for them being in the military, but also now they get to go to these cigar lounges right. and, you know, be part of that. And that was really, like, cool because we didn't, you know, we didn't know if he was going to really like cigars or not. But, right. you know, when he turned 18, that was the first thing he wanted to do was, you know, try a cigar. And so it was like fine. And then Kevin kind of kind of introduced him to some other stuff. But he's done this all kind of on his own and he's like finding out what he likes, what he doesn't sure. like. So and, it's and his friends neat. found out his mom is famous in the no, cigar no, world no, and, uh, and, and, they, and they love it. Yeah. So well well known. <laughs> yeah, well yes. No, but it was just it's neat to be able to share that with him as a mom. Like oh, it's yeah. neat for me. Like it's probably cool for you, but for me it's really it's something special that I get to do with him. No, it, it is. You know, during the height of the Iraqi War, I'm sure you heard this that men and, and women would come back from a mission, and they would. It's the, the use of alcohol is illegal yeah. in these countries. But yeah. they, they would smoke cigars and talk mm -hmm. about the mission and just kind of unwind. And uh, it's interesting. Our two sons, uh, Dawson and Pax, one's 23, one's 26. And uh, all their friends love cigars. Mm -hmm. uh, they smoke. They all. They, they play poker. They play yep. golf. 
but they don't. None of them smoke cigarettes, but they love, but they love cigars. Love cigars. Which is interesting, not because we're in business, but uh, just a lot of the friends from uh, they went to, they went to school up in North Carolina. Uh, Elon, you know, our older one, the other one went to the University of South Carolina, uh, uh, University uh, uh, College of Charleston. Sorry. Oh, okay. And it's a lot of cigar shops and, and mm -hmm. down there, and it's it's full of. People 21 and older, because I know this is a public forum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting too. We've been uh, Eric and I and, and, and Drew have been fighting the um, uh, challenge. The FDA were regulated like a cigarette, like the cigarette industry. We, we're still we're in year 10 now, and uh, we had the FDA we invite the FDA to come down here. And they brought nine toxicologists and three chemists, and uh, they said basically our, our fight's not with you. Our fight is with those those other cigars. Yeah. But um, it um, came out of the FDA. They did a study, and it came out. Drew found it in 2017, in January, the New England Journal of Medicine, mm -hmm. which is arguably the most prestigious medical journal in the world. They, it, the FDA said that they concluded that, that youth do not smoke premium handmade cigars. I, I don't, I agree 100%. Right. They're, yeah. they're not doing that. No, they're, no, they're, no. Nobody's paying $12 for <laughs> a cigar, yeah. you right. know, or $20 for a scar for right. them to, I, what, I mean, they're not inhaling it. It's not, yeah. you know, it's mm -hmm. like, unless they're using it for some other recreational right. use, yeah. but they're not going to use that. No. They're not going to use a premium cigar. And what came out of that study also with the CDC, mm -hmm. the Center for Disease Control based out of Atlanta, mm -hmm. this is all in writing, and I'm leading to a point, that the CDC said that the average American cigar smoker, premium cigar smoker, smokes 1.7 cigars a month, okay. and that will not affect mortality. We t Eric and I and Drew went to see Dr. Scott Gottlieb, the head of the FDA, mm -hmm. with this information, and they, they know it, and they they, they know that occasionally this is not uh, cigars, premium cigars. You'll never see people like you do in the middle of winter hovering outside <laughs> for cigar breaks. Cigarettes, right. yes, but yes. Not, right. Not. You're absolutely right. It's true, and it's not something you can just smoke really fast and be like, yeah. okay, I got my fix. It's not what that's about. You no, know, it is. Good. And so Eric and I, uh, and Drew, and then the board of the or Eric and I, uh, um, Drew and I actually are Cigar Rights of America on the board, um, I just termed off of it. But the nine years after going to Washington, we have lobbyists, we have a lot mm -hmm. of specialists for uh, the Republican Party and specialists for the Democrat Party, a lobbyist, mm -hmm. you have to have that. So you have access when you walk in, you see them on Capitol Hill, and the lobbyists, uh, they, they always say, they would tell me or some other people that we would, some of our other brothers in the cigar industry, they say, let's go out, let's, let's go have a cigar. And they said, oh, the year, over the years, because it used to be, I grew up, people used to say, let's go have a drink. Yeah. Now they say, let's go have a cigar yeah. up yep. there. And uh, the whole culture has changed. It's, it's now a business. Um, when it, uh, Eric and I were growing up, the um, uh, the industry was was shrinking every year. Mm. And Cigar Aficionado came in 1992, and it, it pulled people out of the closet, so to speak, put them on the cover, like Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. and yeah. Demi Moore. I know. What was it? What was it? Um, the one singer. What was his name? Uh, Joe. Oh, the, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, um, oh, Joe Jonas, Joe Jonas was, was just recently was on the cover. And he got a lot of backlash, though, for being on the cover. Right. But, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean, so yeah, we, 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 yeah, for, for, yeah. yeah, for... Maybe because he was younger, you know, because he, you know, I think you're right in that sense when you said it kind of seems like when younger people do something, it seems a little, like, it looks ridiculous, you know, and maybe that's what people were looking, thinking he's very young, but I think he's in his 30s, so, yeah. you know, oh, he's not yeah. a young man. It's part of the Tempe Lightning, they won the, the Stanley Cup, oh, and yeah. unfortunately it was played in Canada, the whole thing, mm -hmm. but... Uh, when they, they when they won the, the last minute, they won. What did they do? They all live. They all yep. cigars. Yep. And for celebration, 
And uh, so it's, every, I say every, I was saying earlier, every business is tough, but uh, it's, it's not, if you love what you do, you've heard this said before, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day Thank in your you. life. Yeah. I think. And uh, so it's a, and the people in the industry, the consumers, the tobacconists, our competitors, some of the greatest people in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, let's yeah. look at the two of you. Yeah, yeah. this is, and this is, this is what we yeah. do for, you know, a, a living, so to speak. Right. And this yeah. is definitely not work, you know, this yeah. is a... Uh, well, uh, a little bit yeah. sometimes. A little, because, yeah. Because he makes it that way. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, you're, you're, you're right if you, you know, if you yeah. do what you love. Yeah, that's true. And it's, it's good because it's also, it gives you a platform. So when you are passionate about things, like, um, you know, we like donating to charities and we like being involved in stuff. So this gives you a, a platform because you're reaching so many people too, to be able to, you know, be able to make a difference in something else that you love to do. So this, exactly. there's you always know, a positive, I feel it, like. It is. It, going back to Cigar Family, uh, ch the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, which is a, a 501c3, which means as an American, if you give a dollar, you can write it off your taxes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking, how are we going to raise money for this because it costs us eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year to get to keep it going. Mm -hmm. We help if we relate, we develop relationships with foundations, but it's not enough to cover the cost. Yep. So um, uh, uh, Carlito and Eric came up with the idea. Well, what we have? Let's call. Let's develop a program. We have two cigars that are not commercially available. We'll put them in a slide top box it's called Toast Across America, and we'll sell it for fifty dollars. Two cigars in a little beautiful box made in the Fuente factory by Carlito, and um, we'll sell it to the tobacconists. They'll 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 pay fifty dollars for it. We ask them that they sell it for fifty dollars, and then send the cigar, send the, all the proceeds, send that fifty dollars per box to the um, per coffin box back to the cigar family, the charitable foundation, which is us. Uh, and uh, in, in 2019, we sold over 11,000 of those. Wow. So you do the math, it's over $550,000. That's so it's a, our biggest fundraiser. Uh, and we're, we're, uh, we're always, we're, we're still shipping uh, 2021. And I think we sold eight or nine. We, we made, we, ca we capped it around 8,000. There's a lot of demand for it. Oh, of course, yeah. it's the shark size, which everyone yeah, loves. Yes. Yeah, everybody wants. And um, so it's it's been it's been a, a, a great ride. You know, with and you know this too. The first American serviceman to lose both eyes in the Global War on Terror was a St. Petersburg resident named Michael Jernigan. Michael's 25 years old. 2004, he was riding in a Humvee in, in a village in Iraq. And they, the um, Humvee ran over an IED, and it was 255 millimeter howitzer shells that were stolen, that were uh, wrapped together. And when it went off, it killed the driver. Michael was in the, riding on top of the machine gun area, and it, it, it was hit in the forehead. It blew, it took both his forehead off and took both eyes out. It was awful. If it had been Vietnam, he would have died. But because of uh, the, the progress uh, military medicine has made, they were able to save his life. And uh, got a call in 2004 from Central Cigar Company in St. Petersburg. One of our accounts said, hey, we want you to, one of your customers, that was, he was, he was uh, smoking Diamond Crown in Arturo Fuente, was severely wounded uh, in Iraq. And I said, well, I didn't know, I'm sorry. I wish I could do something about it. That was the end of the conversation. And his story appeared on the front page, the entire front page of the Sunday St. Pete Times at the mm -hmm. time. And horrific story. And I called his mother. I'm on the board of Southeastern Guide Dogs. And we brought him down to him and his mother, Michael Journey and his mom, and to some of these guide dogs. And he had to, we wanted to give him a guide dog, obviously for free. And uh, there's something that most Americans have never heard of called post-traumatic stress disorder. Now everyone's heard of it. Yeah. Right. During World War II, we used to we used to call it uh, shell shock. Yep. We had a, a man in our neighborhood who was like this, and yeah. I said, Dad, what's wrong with him? Or Daddy, what's wrong with him? It's little, and he, he said, because of World War II, he'd come back. So it, the, the first dog didn't work. He came back a year later, and he ended up with a beautiful uh, drop-dead gorgeous uh, yellow lamb, and it changed his life. It allowed him to go back to college. 
Um, he ended up moving to Washington, went to Georgetown, oh, and he left Georgetown because the, the, the ADA law, American Disabilities Law, they, 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 there's no wheelchair ramps there yeah. and so forth. So he came back and he settled, uh, he graduated from the University of South Florida. And it's just that he and I started this program called Paul for Patriots in 2006, and we've given out over 200 and dogs, so over 250 veterans with, with severe post-traumatic stress. The most famous one is Marcus Luttrell, yeah. a lone survivor. And then Marcus introduced us to Taya Kyle, Chris Kyle's a widow, American sniper. So we've had fundraisers here ever since, every year, and uh, to raise money, we raised a quarter of a million dollars, two hundred sixty thousand dollars in one night, and all, all the money goes back to Southeastern Guide Dogs, which is in Palmetto. So we can, the more money we raise, the more money, the more dogs we can produce. It takes about two years and sixty thousand dollars. Seventy thousand dollars now to train. to train these dogs—a whole process—and um, it's it's been a, a wonderful program. I'm, very sadly, there's it's just public information. There's 22 veterans a day killing, and committing suicide. suicide. Yeah. We've never lost one of our veterans to this terrible malady, and the reason why these dogs have a higher calling, mm -hmm. and uh, they're very well trained. And we cover all 50 states, so I'll tell you and, if, and the people listening, if you know a veteran that needs a service dog, a guide dog, uh, we do got Gold Star families as well. Mm -hmm. You know that, the yes. Gold Star family. Yes. Yeah. People. I know my, my, my son was telling me just how much they all really do check in with each other because it's important um, when they're in the military that always look for signs for each other when yeah. one starts withdrawing because there's so many suicides. It's from, terrible. From these military members, you know, it's just, it's so disheartening. And sometimes, you know, we don't always think about stuff like that because it's not in our everyday, you know. But if people, you know, want to, like, get involved, there's so many different organizations. Like, even, like, for therapy for, like, equestrian. Like, I know a lot of people do um, therapy through horses. Absolutely, and it's so yes. therapeutic. And, you know, I think it's important that keeping that dialogue going and talking right. about stuff and then that's how people can learn and, and heal. It's when people don't do anything or say anything that it just gets pushed aside and then nothing gets done. Yes, you're absolutely right. We have dogs spread out in Walter Reed, a lot of VA hospitals and there there's a there's a, they found out that when you when a person is petting a dog or a cat um, or, or a rabbit, it, it produces oxytocin is released in your brain and it relaxes you and it makes you happy. It's like it's, it's like a natural it's like a natural drug. It makes you happier. Yeah. And as we we found this, and it brings this your stress level down and yes. even gel. This restoration renovation and that is the. Uh, um, Drew's vision, the fourth generation, is by opening the, the factory to the public. <clears throat> that's also the spaces. Let's let's allow people to come in and they can use the facilities for weddings. We had our first wedding uh, oh. right before Christmas, and uh, we had a rehearsal dinner and a wedding because with social media, uh, people are cutting back on what the number of people allowed. Yeah. But we want to make people, people want to come in for a corporate retreat. This is one of the few places in America where you can come in. We are this beautiful cigar factory that you can, if you wish, you can smoke cigars, you can have your favorite beverage, you can have dinner, lunch, breakfast, whatever. And uh, so we had, uh, we, got, we have a lot of weddings coming in here. It's funny because when I was your age, you would never have, you would say, you would never, you never have like, like we have some, one of our hand cigar makers, Luis from behind us, um, he does a lot of weddings. People can't believe the number of people that want to have hand cigar makers at their wedding. And again, when I was your age, <laughs> the, the ladies would say, oh, there's, get that stinky cigar away from me. And now, they, they're, now they're smoking. Yeah. So no, it's I, I do find that interesting, though. There are definitely a lot more women cigar smokers, but there's still a lot of men who wish their wives would smoke a cigar. Oh, and then they start them off with, you know, something maybe that's like infused or, you know, trying sure, to sure. entice them. And either they 
love it or they don't, you know? And I think that's, you know, it could be just maybe how, like, you know, they start thinking that's how women are not supposed to smoke cigars. And that's not true, I don't think. Because growing up, my grandfather smoked a pipe and cigars. And I remember when I was younger, he would let me and my sister and my brother smoke cigars. And so, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's something that's how you're raised to, to think, like, only men smoke cigars and not women. But, uh, but I'm glad it, to see it shift. It now. is shifting. Yes. It's shifting yes. in a, in a yes. very nice way. And I hope, and I wish more women would probably give their husbands a break and let them try the cigar at least one time. Because <laughs> that's one of their things. It's always like, I wish my wife or my girlfriend would, you know, smoke a cigar, at least try it. Right. So, oh, yeah. You know. Listen, speaking of that, in... Uh, uh, a cigar aficionado, they used to have the big smokes, mm-hmm. and at the peak, of, uh, from 1992 to 1997, that's when the industry it went from 100 million units being imported to 500 million. We were in Washington, we are at Lafayette Park across 1,500 people. Lafayette Park, right across mm-hmm. the White House, and you can imagine, uh, it, it, was, it was a cold winter day, and uh, my wife was, was Meredith was with me, and she had our first son, Dawson, in the baby carriage. And I took a picture of her, and she's smoking a big Cuesta Ray church. <laughs> Like that, Perfect. and like that, and my wife has pretty blue eyes, and it, it took it from like here up, and I, I actually take it back. It took it from the, the wheels of the baby carriage up. Oh yeah. And uh, so we we uh, uh, so she she finally made it to the to uh, the, the cigar aficionado in the back page type of thing. It's, that is really cool. that's yeah. such a cool uh, picture though, and just like uh, a momentous moment too. Uh, like oh, well, my, my dad was with. Yeah. Oh. Eric, it, it was. Uh, I mean, we, we've got a poster of it someplace, uh, someplace here. But it's, um, uh, like I say, the industry has, has changed a lot. It's almost like the craft beer industry. Yeah. And the craft beer, I love that industry because it gives people. When I grew up, it was either Miller or Budweiser. <laughs> yeah. You know, Rolling you, Rock. Yeah. You had no chance as as an American, yeah. especially as a young American, if, if you love beer. You had no chance to get into it. You could not become a brewer. Yeah. And today, I think there's over 10,000 different brands. Yeah, there's some people doing some really amazing things with uh, beers and even with some liquor and stuff. You know, right. it's just. Yeah, we got a little microbrew uh, getting ready to open up in our town. Two veterans decided yeah. to open up a, a, a great yeah, little, be, think, great really little brewery. So, go over but yeah, really like well. you said, even 20 years ago, that was just not a that was not a thing. No. no. You know. Yeah. You know, it's funny. There's there's and. Uh, we do hundreds of events. We weren't uh, before COVID. That was in, uh, uh, we were in Cincinnati, and there was the Flying Scotsman. Mm. He was dressed up as a Scot, yeah, he was a young Scots, a young man, American, dressed up as a Scotsman, and he was selling scotch at this, and promoting tasting of it, and selling the bottles at uh, Strauss Tobacconist in, in Cincinnati. And I said, where do you make it? Where do you make it here in Cincinnati? Because you, know, you think scotch, hell? Yeah. <laughs> but, Scotland. But Scotland, bourbon, it, it gives people an opportunity. It gives the Americans, especially young Americans, people like your age and even younger, an opportunity. Follow your passion. Mm-hmm. And, I uh, and vodka. I met Tito, um, you know, Tito Vodka. Mm-hmm. Is it, supposedly it's the number one selling vodka in the United States. Yeah. I met him at a trade show about oh, eight years ago, and he gave me his card and it said Tito Beverage. I said, Beverage, is that a Hollywood name? He said, that's my real name. And uh, so, well, tell me about it. So he started making it in Austin, Texas, mm. in 1994. And he said, I, he said, I kissed everyone's fanny for 20 years. He said, now everyone's kissing mine. Yeah. That's funny. No. Great guy. Uh, and he, it is really good vodka, actually. Oh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it is. Yeah. There's, um, so there's the, that's, it's, it, it's cigars, there, there are obviously, there, there are a lot of new brands that have come in, mm-hmm. but it gives everyone an opportunity. Yes. The, the, this industry, just like the, the, the uh, beer industry and, and now the, the spirits industry. 
yep. which is which is nice. Listen, I mean, you have a great, you've got this great Zoom program. Mm -hmm. but you could you could also you could talk, you could do the same thing with with uh, bourbons and scotches and, and. Yeah, yeah, we yeah we've had that on our show like a once a month. We do. Uh, yeah, yeah um, but Kevin is a he drinks one thing only diet and Bacardi. <laughs> I'm I'm just I'm a simple guy. I love Bacardi. He, he I love Bacardi. Really like I love Bacardi. Uh, everything Bacardi makes. Yeah. I'm just I'm yeah. I'm brand loyal when it comes right. to just my rum. I well, like. Well, and he also will. Um, he usually admits like what happens if he tries something and then he really likes. It. Yeah. Then he's gonna have to like you know obsess over just that for a little. Bit. I, I don't want he it to become. I don't want to become like cigars. You know, like so we we collect cigars. Well, you, no, not we. Yeah, yeah. Someone else does. And you find like this new cigar. He likes to yeah, you like you find this new cigar. You buy a bunch of them. Right. You buy a bunch oh, of these. Yeah. And then you cycle yeah. through all or of them. I'm, so. I'm open to trying. I love trying anything. Anything new. You know, I'm all about it. And so, um, right now, I'm really into um, going to this one winery mm -hmm. that's actually up here near Tampa. It's a uh, and uh, curly winery. Oh my gosh, their wine is fantastic. It's so great. Which is wonderful. It's right? so great, and I'm obsessed with it right now. But I'll go and be obsessed with another wine <laughs> probably a couple months from now. <laughs> Listen, I'm old enough to be your father, <laughs> and both of you. And when I went to school in Tennessee, Eric and I went to Swanee up in the mountains of Tennessee, and um, no one had eaten, no one caught the pee in, so we drink, we drink um, Paps Blue Ribbon beer. Yep. And, uh, and then Saturday night, if you had a really special date, you would get a wine either from France or mm. from Portugal, and because all the cheap wines were the screw tops right. from California. I was going to say it was probably like a sangria if it was from Portugal. It was, it was, it was Matus and Lancers. Oh, was it? <laughs> and if you ever heard of those brands, beautiful bottles. But yeah. you know, th the things have evolved, and um, it was Scarfisha Nato's idea to start rate putting a number to rate blind tasting. Here's a great, here's a great French Bordeaux, and here's a Napa Valley or Sonoma Valley a Bordeaux, yeah. uh, or a um, uh, some other type of wine. And they found out that it's stuff coming from California. It was rating higher than the French. And that was that was the beginnings of the entire wine industry. So now, if you want, the three of us wanted to go in the wine industry, we can. Do, we don't have to go to France. Life is very funny that we were doing a, uh, a regional sales manager, Alan Goldfarb, out of Miami, and I were doing a, a big Diamond Crown event at Sand Lake Road at Jeff's Storage in Toronto. We get there, and there's there's two uh, young men. They're well built, and they're from the Horse Soldier from American Freedom Story. Or in St. Petersburg, and uh, one of them had one of our dogs, and a um, uh, beautiful black lab with a coat to Southeastern mm -hmm. Guide Dogs, and um, it's probably a HIPAA violation, but I said, why do you have hobbies? And I told introduce myself, mm -hmm. and we started the program, the veterans program, well, so how does the dog help you? And he said he's had, uh, he had over 30 deployments, mm -hmm. Green Beret, retired, and it, it caused seizures. And because he'd been in so many IEDs, 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 yeah. and uh, the dog uh, alerts him to before he uh, before he has a seizure. We as humans throw off for a lot of things uh, signs, and there's electrical impulses that are before you have a seizure, and the dog is trained to start pawing at him, so he'll know that either he has to sit down or lay down yeah. before he yeah. just collapses. That's and, so uh, amazing. That it, it is, and their story is, uh, you know, they're, they're, the movie 12 Strong, Chris mm -hmm. Helmsworth played uh, played Captain Mark Nooch. Mm -hmm. So five of those men that were portrayed in the movie, uh, four or five, uh, started, they came back to, to St. Peter's, they said, Tampa area, and they started this American Freedom to Story, mm -hmm. and they were the and where the name come from, Horse Soldiers, because they were part of the movie Twelve Strong. These there's a Green Beret A team. There are three Green Beret A teams. Each each team has twelve men, and this was about a particular A team. And they, it shows how they landed in the movie. Uh, they, they flown at nighttime at Black Hawk, and if you and how. 
their their mission was to defeat the 50,000 Taliban army. Yes. Now, how could 36 men do that? They use it by um, they were they became spotters. They, they landed. And the movie is very accurate because when they landed in uh, in Afghanistan at nighttime, they, they met with a CIA operative, mm -hmm. an American. And he would introduce them to the only tribe fighting the Taliban at the time it was called it was called the Northern Alliance, and they got together. Uh, so this Green Beret team, twelve guys, they had no way to 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 uh, to, to quickly go to uh, to travel to the, where the bad guys are. Mm -hmm. So they they gave them pony. They yeah. became horse soldiers. Yeah, it was a great movie. Oh, and we great. we absolutely loved it. Yeah. That was and, such uh, a great movie. It is. And the American Freedom Story, they, they spent four and a half million dollars. Uh, it's about five blocks from Tropicana Field. And it's a, in a, in kind of a warehouse uh, mm -hmm. area. You, it looks kind of similar to beautiful on the inside. It's all new. But it's a, there's a statue in there. The, it's called at ground, today at Ground Zero in New York, where the, the Twin Towers fell. There's, it's about a 40 foot tall a memorial. It's a picture, it, it's a statue, uh, a bronze statue of a horse, one of, the, one of the horses that was used in Afghanistan, rearing up it with a green beret with a floppy hat. He looks like Rambo, <laughs> all his hand grenades and everything else. So that the original statue is sitting at American Freedom Story, wow. and it was made. The artist made this, the mold, and it's sitting there. And uh, so, if you get a chance to see it, or you're oh, yeah, wow. to go to, to go over that it, out. it's amazing. The, the restaurant is. Um, you have private rooms. You can't get in there. It's open Thursday, Friday. Sounds like an ad for them, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they're good friends and they're good people, and uh, as well. But it just also goes to show that the you know the guide dogs are helping. You know, it's a legit thing that's actually doing something good for a lot of these vets. You know, I mean, it's, uh, having seizures alone, like, is scary, you know, and then being alone right. and not, you know, and then dealing with all the aftermath of some of the stuff that they've probably seen and had to do. I can only imagine what that triggers. So if this lessens that, you know, oh I mean, my the guide dog, yeah. like... The, yeah, the, the service dogs are, 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 are incredible. I think Americans, the, Ameri the um, American sniper... It, it, it's the number one grossing war movie of all time. Did over five hundred million dollars. It's it's the money's are, it's slowed down, but uh, if you if I see the movie American Sniper, and you see these young Marines going by, try, you know, break, trying to get into the door, what's behind where the bad guys are, and you don't know what's waiting for you, booby traps. And if you did that for twelve months, you, you come yeah. back. And, and a lot of the, like you said, he did so many deployments. A lot of times those deployments were back to back to back. Oh, they yeah. would be home for maybe a, a week and then right. right back out there. I can't, I can't even imagine what that was like for for them so that's why I said, and I said before you were rolling the camera that, that thank you both for your service because when your son or daughter or husband yeah. or wife goes you all go that's absolutely true absolutely well uh, Bobby we want to thank you for giving us your time today opening up your uh, uh, the factory and sitting down yeah. and chatting with us well you're welcome we're looking forward to a, a, a Ybor City lunch I know at, yes yeah. at 12 o'clock at the Columbia yeah. make yourself at home and uh, I love these things thank you for coming into to the our, our home yeah. and uh, uh, this is your home and uh, anything we can do to help you just let us know please mm -hmm. thank you very thank much you. All right. thank you thank you much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jesse and Kevin. Thank you. What a fantastic interview. Unbelievable. Yeah, that was really great. It, it, it was fantastic. Um, uh, if you're in or near um, uh, Tampa, Florida, you've definitely got to stop in uh, uh, to the J.C. Newman El, El Relo factory here in uh, historic Ybor City. Yeah. Um, definitely, if you're lo at your local brick and mortar, definitely uh, check out the new Perla Del Mar, um, yeah. uh, the new Corojo, the Maduro, the shade. Um, I mean, check out anything. That check make. Any, any, anything <laughs> J.C. Newman. You got the American. You've got you've got your your favorite is the Diamond Crown uh, yeah. Maximus, yeah. and uh, we just love um, everything that J.C. Newman makes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and but definitely, be, if you ever get a chance to come here to get a tour, oh, hands down, you will not be disappointed. You will not it's be disappointed. Um, uh, we talked about Southeastern Guide Dogs. Uh, yeah. There's a link down below. Um, we sponsor a dog. Um, her name is Daphne. Um, for as little as $25 a month, for the price of just two cigars, um, you can sponsor a dog. And and they send you updates and pictures. And oh, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, the, they're called the pup, pup Dates. Yeah, Pup Dates. Yeah, so yeah. you'll get pictures of your dog. Super cool organization. We support them. So yeah. um, if you if you can support them as well, um, that would be great. Yeah. And um, yeah, thanks for thank thank you for tuning in. There. And we're gonna uh, we're gonna go smoke some more cigars. Yeah.